thank you for the opportunity to be speaking to you about the ocular hypertension treatment study, what 20 years of follow-up taught us. As you know, the OATS is probably the largest randomized clinical trial in glaucoma and probably one of the most expensive, but also one that taught us many lessons that we can apply to clinical practice. So these are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to this presentation. So just a reminder that for the OATS, the inclusion criteria were patients between the ages of 40 and 80, the qualifying IOPs above statistical normal limits, normal angles, and normal visual fields and optic discs. In this trial, a target pressure reduction of 20% or lower than 24 millimeters of mercury was required and all available modalities of medical therapy could be used to lower the pressure. So in summary, this study, the trial started in 1994 with the criteria I just mentioned, and patients were randomized to either medication or observed, and they were followed every six months with visual fields and photos, uh, photos every year. And in case of any abnormality in either test, the, the, the results were evaluated by a, a adjudication committee that defined whether the patient reached a POAG endpoint. After the first phase of OATS, because of the substantial benefit of treatment, treatment was offered to both groups. So both the initial medication group and the initial plus or observation group were treated with uh, IOP lowering modalities. The main finding of the ocular hypertension treatment study, of course, is that a reduction in pressure of 20% as I mentioned, reduces the risk of incident POAG by 50 to 60%. Uh, and in, in specific numbers, the rate among those in the observation group was almost 10% versus about 4% in those treated, which is a significant effect. This is the graph showing the main results, showing again, although the rate of conversion to POAG was low, uh, treatment had a significant effect on those rates. One of the most important results in the past 20 years, of course, was the effect of race on the risk of POAG conversion. Among African Americans, uh, there was a greater risk in numerical absolute values from 20, 12.7% versus 10.2 in other groups. Uh, they're also more likely to develop endpoints uh, in, uh, in the medication group. However, these, these differences were not statistically significant. In fact, when they looked at the self-identified race and looked at other uh, factors for progression, such as corneal thickness, uh, uh, visual field PSD, uh, and cup to disc ratio, race alone was not an independent risk factor. So this is one of the critical findings from that trial. Another of the main findings from the OATS was, of course, the effect of central corneal thickness as a, as a risk for glaucoma conversion. This was probably the first study to show that association, which even today we use that information for risk stratification and defining the target uh, pressure for our patients. Another of the main findings, in my opinion, was the relationship between disc hemorrhages and glaucoma conversion. So uh, out of the entire sample on the OATS, 128 eyes develop optic disc hemorrhage. Uh, those values were more common, those disc hemorrhage were more common, uh, of course, in those who did not develop a POAG. However, when we look at the entire sample and we define the risk of POAG development, the presence of a disc hemorrhage was significantly associated with uh, conversion to POAG. And the median time from the onset of this hemorrhage or detection of this hemorrhage and POAG was about 13 months. One of the most important findings, however, was the importance of disc photography in terms of detection of disc hemorrhage. Given the importance of this risk factor, it's important to detect them during visits. And just by looking at the optic nerve without a disc photo, you're, you're six times likely to lose, to miss a disc hemorrhage. So this trial also uh, heightened the importance of optic disc documentation with disc photos to detect disc hemorrhages. 
Uh, of course, there are different uh, confounders for the assessment of the role of the scavenger in POG conversion. So other risk factors needed to be taken into account, such as age, virtual cup to use ratio, visual field, pressure, corner thickness. And even taking into that account, in the univariate analysis, without taking them, there was six-fold increased risk of conversion to AG with these cambridges, and this risk was 3.7 when adjusted, showing it to be a, a statistically significant independent risk factor. In the first analysis of the oaths, uh, however, there was no significant difference in the rate of this cambridge in treated and observed groups. Notice the difference here. One thing is the relationship with this, this cambridge and the risk of developing PYG. But the first analysis shows that the number of these cambridges in treated and observation groups was not different, which is a very interesting finding. However, the most recent analysis of this data now shows that this difference was significant. So patients who were treated were also less likely to develop these cambridges. One critical finding as well is that the more these cambridges the eye developed, the more likely it was to uh, reach a POAG endpoint, showing that at least in ocular hypertensive patients, uh, there's a cumulative effect of recurrence of these cambridges and the risk of POAG conversion. Another study that uh, came from our group is looking at what's the rate of visual field progression in old patients with these cambridges. And what we found is that uh, patients with this carriage protest at 0.17 dB per year as opposed to 0.07, uh, which was statistically significant, showing how this carriage is such an important predictor of future visual field loss. What is key though, what is a key find is that the presence of this carriage in the oats was as important as being 10 years older on average of having a pressure 11 millimeters of mercury above the baseline average or having a thicker cornea by 23 mic, a thinner cornea by 23 microns, or a worse PSD or a larger cup to disc ratio, which also heightens the importance of this risk factor. Another key finding from the OATS for us is the development of our first and probably most important risk model for uh, prediction of POG conversion. So as you enter those risk factors that I mentioned earlier, you're able to obtain the five-year risk uh, that the patient will convert to POAG. In this case here, 16.9% risk. This is, of course, based on uh, the risk factors identified in the OATS, but also in the EGPS, which is Early Glaucoma Prevention Study performed uh, in Europe, and that were validated in a very uh, important paper. Uh, in fact, when looking at the performance of this risk model compared to the one that most why we most uh, commonly hear, which is the Framingham Heart Study Risk Model, the performance was pretty equivalent, showing its robustness to, to be used, used in our practice. This is available online, so it's free, uh, and I think everyone should be using this when assessing risk of, of, of hypertensive patients. Finally, one of the main findings was the effect of delayed treatment. As we saw, treatments decreased the risk of conversion to PRG, but uh, when should we do it? Is it really necessary to start, start treating these patients from the beginning? So in this study, uh, they looked at uh, the effect of, of treatment after treatment was offered to both groups. So remember that in the beginning, uh, it was only offered to one group, but later because of the significant benefits, the observation group was also treated. So after following this other group for another five years, they were able to look whether delay in treatment resulted in worse outcomes. And uh, what they, they found in that analysis was that uh, here you have the pressure measurements. So as you can see in the first part of the study, or O2-1, we see that there was a significant difference between groups, of course, because one group was treated and the other one was not. But later, where if OATS2 started, then the pressures became equivalent or very similar. Uh, and what the main analysis showed is that uh, those who were treated later were also more likely to develop a POAG endpoint. And this was true among uh, other racial groups, but also in particular among those of African descent, 
showing again that there probably there is an advantage of treatment early in general, but in particular among those of African descent. However, the key finding was that when you stratify those patients based on their risk using the risk calculator, note that in the lower risk group, there was not much benefit in treating those patients earlier, showing that in low risk patients, you could probably follow them longer before you start treatment. However, in the middle, middle group for risk and the highest risk group, that effect was very substantial, showing that among high risk patients, defined here above a risk, a five-year risk of 13%, there's a real clear benefit of starting treatments as soon as uh, these patients come for our first visits. So delaying treatment in OATS increases the cumulative incidence of POAG, also increases the likelihood that the patients reached uh, an optic nerve or visual field endpoint, and more patients develop bilateral glaucoma. Also important that they are likely to develop glaucoma within a shorter period of time. However, what's interesting that the effect was not that significant when you look at the mean deviation or the PSD between the two groups. Um, another important finding is that despite early initiation of treatment and the patient being exposed to drugs, drugs that have systemic absorption, uh, there was no different safety between groups, no difference in mortality, and no difference in adverse reactions to treatments, as well as no change, no difference between eyes in terms of their risk of eye operations. Uh, however, uh, early treatment will require more of the non-eye non operations, which is a finding that still warrants further uh, investigation. We also looked at the rate of visual field progression between eyes that did and did not develop uh, POAG, and uh, for uh, those who did never develop a POAG endpoint, the average rate was very close to zero, as you can see here, 0.05 decibel per year. And among those who developed POAG, the rate was very fast, or compared to those, the other group very fast, and very close to what we know to occur in patients with uh, established POAG on their treatments. Uh, we also looked at the effect of treatments on the rates of visual field progression and the OATS. And uh, by looking at the point-wise and global rates of change before and after treatment was initiated as part of OATS2. And our findings that there was significant effect not only on the global, meaning the mean deviation rate of progression, but also in the number of points that were progressing during the trial. In fact, for each millimeter of mercury lower IOP, uh, the rate of mean deviation progression became 0.1 uh, decibels lower, which is a very significant effect. So in summary, in the OATS, IOP lowering treatment reduced the risk of POAG conversion, but above all, this effect was the greatest among those with high risk at baseline. This camera and central coronary thickness are critical uh, risk factors that need to be taken into account, in particular in combination or, or associated with using the OATS risk model it really changed the way we assess risk in our patients and make our decisions regarding treatment. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to talk uh, in seven minutes on uh, the LIGHT study, laser trabeculoplasty and glaucoma and ocular hypertension study. Um, should laser trabeculoplasty be the first intervention? Well, uh, these are my financial disclosures. The glaucoma laser trial in 1990 um, suggested that uh, ALT, argon laser trabeculoplasty, was more effective than Timolol as a first-line treatment. Yet laser was widely adopted in the United States where the trial was performed and almost never as first-line treatment. The uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty um, the, the, came along and the light study is different from the glaucoma laser trial and it's not just a primary treatment trial of pressure lowering, but it's a quality of life trial, which, which is slightly different. It was published in the Lancet last year. Uh, this was a, a large observer-masked randomized 
clinical trial of treatment naive patients with open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension and no ocular comorbidity. And they were recruited between 2012 and 2014 at six sites in the UK. They were randomly allocated um, to receive initial SLT or eye drops. And it, now this is a key point, rather than a, a, a standard bar for success, an objective target intraocular pressure was set according to glaucoma severity. The primary outcome, as I mentioned, was health-related related quality of life at three years, as assessed by EQ5D. And secondary outcomes were cost-effectiveness and disease-specific uh, quality of life, clinical effectiveness and safety. Analysis was by intention to treat. And there were a number of inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria uh, included uh, uh, patients need to be more than 18 years of age, um, uh, OHT or POAG, and exclusion were, was advanced glaucoma, um, childhood glaucoma, obviously, and uh, cataract, uh, and a number, a number of other ocular diseases. The, uh, Target IOP was set by an algorithm which is uh, published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology here, and there isn't really time to go through, but, it, but to say that the target treatment IOP was set in the study. And then there was a decision-making algorithm set according to what to do if the patient failed to meet target. And again, that's in the, the baseline uh, in the design and methodology paper in the BJO. But in summary, 16,000 patients were screened, 15,000 didn't meet uh, were ex didn't meet the eligibility criteria and were excluded, uh, 718 were randomized, uh, of whom 356 got SLT and 362 got uh, tr uh, allocated to eye drops. Uh, 329 al analyzed in the SLT group, 323 analyzed in the medication first group. Uh, as I mentioned, there were six UK centers, mean age around 63 years old. Um, the, there was a slight male predominance, interestingly, and 70% white. Uh, again, 73% POH, uh, sorry, uh, OHT. And uh, interestingly, 30% of the family history of glaucoma. You can see from here that the mean visual field uh, entry, obviously for the OHT patients, was uh, the, the mean deviation was less than minus one. But for the POAG, the mean deviation was under minus three. So it's really uh, not, uh, these are very mild glaucomas and OHT. So I'm not really doing SLT for advanced glaucoma. You can see here that the baseline quality of life scores uh, were equal between the two groups uh, down through all the, 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 the the tools that were used. Of the 718 patients randomized, I mentioned uh, 356 were to SLT, 362 to eye drops. The average EQ5D score at three years was actually almost identical in the two groups. So there's really no quality of life difference at three years. If you can see the small print here, these quality of life uh, tools, um, there were really no difference in any of them in three years. And uh, throughout the study from the start and each time it was measured, the EQ5D was similar between the two groups. So there's really no, no real difference in quality of life at three years. However, 36 months, 74% of the SLT group were medication free. And within target pressure, 93% of visits. Uh, compared with 91% in the, the drop group. So 74% were medication-free after SLT, although it was only 58% were medication-free after one SLT, some required two. This is the Predictors of Success paper. There, there are a number of papers, and there's no time to go through them all, obviously, but this is a, a paper looking at the, what predicted uh, uh, SLT success. And essentially, um, high baseline IOP, male gender, um, uh, were predictors of success yes, and total SLT power. And you can see here um, that the higher uh, 
the, the higher the baseline pressure on the uh, x-axis, the um, absolute pressure reduction on the y-axis. And you can see there is a, an obvious relationship between uh, pressure, uh, baseline pressure and pressure reduction. On logistic regression analysis, uh, you, can, you, you can see here that, that female gender was actually uh, prejudiced against success. Um, uh, whereas uh, 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 black ethnicity, a slight tendency towards success, and baseline IOP was obviously uh, highly significant, as I've mentioned. And th these were not uh, so obvious on the uh, logistic regression analysis. What about repeat SLT? It's been claimed for years that you repeat an SLT and it works. Everyone says you can repeat an SLT. I said, well, you can repeat it, but does it work? This is the question. Well, in fact, it does. And surprisingly in this study, repeat SLT worked better, slightly better than the first SLT. So for those out there who's, who've been saying for years that repeat SLT works, it actually does. So the, the light study demonstrated clear benefits of selective laser trabeculoplasty where medical therapy in newly diagnosed medication-naive ocular hypertensive and early glaucoma patients. It's a very good first-line treatment with three quarters of the patients remaining medication-free at three years and almost 60% achieving that with only one SLT. I would point out that this is 360 degree SLT. There's no real justification for doing 180 at the time. That, that was true of ALT, but not of SLT. And SLT, remember, you require 360 degrees of SLT to get the same effect as 180 degrees of ALT. So it, and repeat is effective, and IOP spikes are very rare, less than 2% in the study. Thank you for your attention. <music>
possibly nausea, and they can develop secondary sequelae like the cataract and iris changes shown below. So the real question of this study is, what do you do with people who have angle closure who don't have disease? Uh, if you think about China, uh, it's a population that is aging dramatically, and there are gonna be a lot of older people, and older people are very high risk of angle closure glaucoma. Well, we have evidence from many population-based studies, but I'm showing one from India, the Chennai glaucoma study, and you can see the distribution of angle closure disease if we wanna call it that. And what this is showing is with all the people dying and people aging and people uh, living their lives, when you go out and look at a population, you have about 300 people who are suspects, 100 who have angle closure but have no disease, and finally 34 who have glaucoma. So if you look at all people with angle closure, less than 10% have a disease that will affect them in their lifetime. If we look at the population over 50 in China, there are gonna be over 600 million people by the year 2050 in China that are over the age of 50. And the rates of angle closure in this population are very high, 15 to 20%. And so we're talking about an enormous number of people who you might be treating if you treated them all. So should we be? Should we be treating all these people? And that's a question that we asked in the Zhongshan Angle Closure Prevention Trial. We have evidence from a natural history of angle closure subjects that laser iridotomy is effective. Uh, this was in Singapore. These were older, mostly Chinese people, followed about six years after they had an acute attack in one eye. And attack eyes did badly. About half of them had glaucoma. They had uh, loss of visual field, uh, and the contralateral eyes uh, did well. If you had an attack, you had a one in 10 chance of being blind. We look at the contralateral eyes, only 5% of them developed any evidence of glaucoma, and for three of those, it was nerve findings only without visual field loss. So we know that avoiding acute attacks is good, and we know iridotomy can prevent them. And that if you do an iridotomy in the fellow eye, those eyes seem to do pretty well. So shouldn't we just do iridotomy in everyone? Well, iridotomy is not without risk. And you can have various adverse outcomes. Uh, there is a disruption of blood aqueous barrier, and some people have prolonged inflammation. There's the acute pressure rise that occurs in some. Uh, there are reported burns of the cornea, the lens, the retina. We know that there may be glare or diplopia uh, caused by the iridotomy. And we really didn't know before we did this study about whether cataract or endothelial cell loss would occur after iridotomy. So the study uh, was conducted in Guangzhou and we screened over 10,000 people in order to enroll close to 900 people and we followed them for six years. We picked a composite endpoint. So this was an endpoint that could be any of these three uh, things occurring, the pressure going above 24 on two separate occasions, or the development of synechiae of at least one clock hour, or an acute attack of angle closure. Uh, these subjects were on average about 60 years of age and more often female than male, which is uh, how angle closure is in the community. And you would expect both eyes to be quite similar because we randomized one eye of a patient and left the other eye untreated. So really, this is a almost perfectly controlled study with uh, the same person acting as his or her own control. I show this also because you have all the findings that you would expect. Uh, these people have shallower anterior chamber depth, shorter axial length, um, and slightly are slightly hyperopic, uh, as you would expect in angle closure. If we look at the composite endpoint, uh, there was a benefit to iridotomy. Iridotomy presented, prevented some of these endpoints from occurring, uh, but the rates of anything occurring were very low. Even in those eyes that did not have an iridotomy, there were only eight events per 1,000 eye years, or one event in 125 
uh, years. So people really were very unlikely to have anything happen to them. And if we look at what actually did happen to them, uh, the vast majority of outcomes were pressure related. So the eye pressure uh, was, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. Yeah, that's fine. Just pick it up the slide before then. I'll go back and I'll enter this slide. Yeah. I'll go back to this one and we'll start from the next slide. Okay. Yep, perfect. When we look at the main outcomes of the study, we see that the composite endpoint uh, was more likely to be reached if you did not have an iridotomy. So the control patients had more events, they had eight events per 1,000 eye years versus about four in the iridotomy arm. So this is a real uh, reduction in endpoints. Uh, but the events were rare in both groups. And then if we look at what actually happened, uh, the vast majority of events in the control eyes were the development of synechia of one clock hour or more. Uh, that was really the big difference. There also were a few acute attacks in the control eye. There were five and only one in the iridotomy eye. Well, what about those acute attacks? Uh, three control eyes and one iridotomy treated eye had an acute attack after dilation. We wanted to assess for cataract in this study, and so we did dilate subjects annually, and some of them developed acute attacks after dilation. This came out to six acute angle closure attacks per 10,000 dilations in control eyes. So even without an iridotomy, it was very unlikely with dilation to develop an acute attack. And this argues that even if somebody has a narrow angle, if they have some acute retinal problem, you should dilate them and not wait. Uh, there were only two attacks in the control eyes outside of dilation. So over six years in nearly 900 people, if you follow them, there were two attacks if these patients were not dilated. Uh, this comes out to you know, four cases in 10,000 eye years if untreated and not dilated. There were some minor uh, adverse events associated with having the iridotomy, some localized bleeding, uh, localized corneal burning, some uh, pressure elevations, uh, but endothelial cell counts were similar across the two groups at five years, six years, and cataract grade was similar as well. So overall, uh, LPI was protective, but mainly just against the development of synechia, which is an interim outcome and really would not affect a patient's life. Most cases of acute attacks were following dilation, and only two control eyes had an acute angle closure attack outside of dilation over six years. We felt, in summary, that we may be doing too many iridotomies, and ultimately, uh, we probably should not be screening for and trying to prevent angle closure glaucoma by identifying all patients with primary angle closure suspect status. Thank you. My talk today is on the role of lens extraction for angle closure glaucoma, in particular with relevance to the EAGLE trial. I have no disclosures. I'd like to send you my greetings from Singapore. Angle closure glaucoma is an important form of glaucoma worldwide, especially in Asia. The current management of angle closure glaucoma involves, firstly, doing a gonioscopy to make the right diagnosis of angle closure, assessing for the degree of angle closure, particularly the cynical angle closure, assessing their intraocular pressure, as well as the amount of optic nerve and visual field damage. The conventional treatment of angle closure glaucoma is laser iridotomy. And this is a treatment that relieves pupil block. As you can see in the example here, after iridotomy, the angle opens up and the iris convexity reduces with relief of pupil block. However, we know that some angles do not open after iridotomy, as in the example below, 
there's no change of the laser iridotomy. And this is because laser iridotomy only treats one mechanism of angle closure, and particularly that of pupil block, and there are other mechanisms involved in angle closure. We also know that the lens is an important component of angle closure glaucoma, even in pupil block, and removing the lens would also remove pupil block. And so the current management of angle closure glaucoma involves asking the first question, is there a significant cataract? And if there is so, consider doing FACO as the first treatment. Here's an example of a patient with a very large lens. In such a case, removing the lens has to be the main treatment. We know that after lens extraction and removal of the lens, the angle opens up and there's much more space in the anterior chamber. We only perform laser iridotomy if the patient has no cataract, mild cataract, or the patient is unwilling to undergo phaco emulsification. Another question you have to look for is the severity of angle closure glaucoma. And if there's very severe angle closure glaucoma with extensive optic nerve damage, you may need to consider doing a phaco trabeculectomy. And this is because a phaco alone may only be sufficient in mild cases of angle closure glaucoma. And for advanced cases with a risk of IOP spike and poor IOP control, you may need to combine this with the trabeculectomy and mitomycin C. How about acute angle closure? Well, studies have also looked at the effect of FACO versus LPI for acute angle closure, and one from Hong Kong and one from Singapore. In both studies, they recruited patients with significant cataract of at least 20 30 vision or worse. In the Hong Kong study, over two years, over 18 months, they found that FACO emulsification was much more successful than laser iridotomy in terms of long-term IOP control. Almost 50% of laser cases needed medications, whereas only 3% of FACO cases needed medications. The Singapore study over two years also showed similar results with about almost 40% of LPI cases needing medication versus only 0.5% in the, in the FACO arm. This shows you that FACO is a very effective treatment for acute angle closure with long-term better control of intraocular pressure compared to laser iridotomy. However, there's no clear consensus on the optimal timing for phaco emulsification. Should you do it early or should you wait a little longer after the patient's inflammation settles down? We move on to another case scenario, a newly diagnosed case, patient of angle closure glaucoma with intraocular pressure of 24 and cutlass ratio of 0.8 but with 6-6 vision. What will you do for this patient? Will you do a FACO emulsification? This is an example of a patient with angle closure glaucoma with a clear lens or no significant cataract. And many studies have looked at the effect of clear lens extraction, and initially these were case series, but the EAGLE trial was a large randomized controlled trial published in 2006, and EAGLE stands for Effectiveness of Early Lens Extraction for the Treatment of Angle Closure Glaucoma. The hypothesis of this trial was that initial clear lens extraction would be associated with better quality of life, lower IOP, and less need for glaucoma surgery at three years, compared to standard of care, which was laser RPI. And this is a randomized controlled trial regarding patients more than 50 years of age with either newly diagnosed PACG or PAC with IOP more than 30. And these were patients were randomized to these two treatment arms. The main outcome measure of this study was the patient-related health status or quality of life, and secondary outcome measures were intraocular pressure and cost-effectiveness. More than 400 patients were enrolled in this study, and at the three years outcome uh, out endpoint, the quality of life or health status was much better in the clear lens extraction group compared to LPI, and IAP was also one millimeter better in the clear lens extraction group showing you the less need for glaucoma medications and further glaucoma surgery. A subgroup analysis also showed it was cost-effective to do phaco emulsification, at least in the UK subgroup. So the EAGLE trial conclusions was that clear lens extraction was superior than LPI in terms of patient-related outcomes, IOP control, glaucoma surgery, and medications, as well as cost-effectiveness, and showing you good evidence that clear lens extraction could also be considered as initial treatment for angle closure glaucoma. However, there are some issues with EAGLE trial in particular. They define clear lenses as symptoms, but perhaps they had some degree of cataract. They were mostly milder cases of angle closure glaucoma, and probably they did not include very severe cases. And most of the surgery 
were done by experienced surgeons, and that's why they had very good results. In how the patient would really benefit in day-to-day -day life. So as the EGLE trial man affected my management of angle closure glaucoma with clear lenses, I think that this study has provided good evidence for clear lens FACO, and certainly there's a trend towards earlier lens extraction. However, I'm not sure I will do clear lens extraction for my cases in all cases, because this is a very aggressive approach, and I'll certainly discuss this option with patients with clear lenses and angle closure glaucoma. Remember, there are many risks of doing FACO in, clear, in angle closure glaucoma. These are difficult cases. Anterior chamber is often shallow with large lenses, and there's risk of complications, including corneal damage as well as supracoral hemorrhage. So certainly, you should have good experience when performing such surgery. In summary, the lens is a major component of angle closure glaucoma. Lens extraction should be considered as a primary treatment option for patient with angle closure glaucoma for long-term control of IOP especially if there's current cataract. Depending on the, the severity of angle closure glaucoma, it may be combined with trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Remember, clear lens, lens extraction can be technically challenging with risk of complications. The EGLE trial has certainly given good data on the trend for earlier lens extraction. But remember, again, the risk of complications in patients with good vision. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Homer. I'm an ophthalmologist in Vienna. I'm specialized in glaucoma care. I work in a hospital and in a private office. Most of my patients are glaucoma patients, and I'm participating in many studies, especially phase three studies. My topic is about medical therapy. Is there anything new about it? So this is my financial disclosure. I'm speaking for a couple of companies, but I have no stocks, bonds, or anything like that. The challenge in glaucoma is that we have, of course, drops now for by far more than 150 years nearly. The powers of pneumatics have been the first ones, and we have the prostaglandins who are the gold standard now for quite some time. And the challenge is now that new drugs have to be better than the most economic and best available ones, which are the prostaglandins, and this is, of course, a challenge, and not everybody can do it. Uh, there are different options what we can do in, for new medications. The one is that we look for another pathway, because usually we have, oral, we have drops, but maybe we can look on oral therapy or slow-release formulations. I will not go through the other pathway options. Uh, I just want to mention the slow-release ring and the slow-release injection is, of course, something quite interesting because it reduces the compliance challenge we have with medical therapy and we can reduce the, to the problem with the topical tolerability and it makes it maybe easier for the patients and for the doctors. I want to speak more about two uh, molecules that are quite interesting and they come on the market or came just recently on the market or will come on the market depending on your country. The one are the so-called ROC kinase inhibitors, uh, the ROC press side. We know that uh, the mechanism of action for glaucoma IOP lowering uh, medications are either by aqueous humor production to reduce it or to increase uveal scleral or trabecular outflow. Now, netazotil or the rocinase inhibitors are actually, it's a protein that works as a regulator of the actomyosin skeleton and it's a promoter, therefore, the contractile force generation and the working. Uh, mechanism for netazotil is to lower the intraocular pressure by targeting the trabecular outflow pathway. And it relaxes the trabecular meshwork, and by that it increases the trabecular outflow, as you can see nicely here. Uh, so there are a couple of studies that have looked on it, but interesting, and another point that I want to point out at the beginning is that uh, it, so it uh, definitely reduces or improves the trabecular meshwork outflow facility, what you can see on the left side, uh, versus um, a vehicle uh, in percentage. And it increases as well, uh, it changes the mean diurnal episterial venous pressure. And this is by reducing this pressure, the IOP lowering effect 
could be maintained or could be reached as well. And uh, we will see later on that this has an interesting effect on the baseline IOP criteria. So uh, there are two groups of studies uh, with netazotil. The one are the monotherapy studies. They are called the rocket studies, where they were compared mainly with timolol and they were com compared with netazotil either once or twice a day, depending on the daytime. And they were looking for three months up to one year how it worked. And the Mercury studies are the ones where it was a fixed combination with latanoprost given once a day and compared to the monotherapy of netazotil only or latanoprost only. Uh, so going to the netazotil efficacy by itself, so to the rocket studies, we can see if we put them all together, we have about 1,600 patients who've been randomized either to netazotil or timolol in these three studies, and they were looking on the intraocular pressure three day times over three months, and you can see nicely here that the IOP lowering effect is very similar in both groups. Uh, and But if you look then to uh, the IOP reduction depending on the baseline intraocular pressure, you can see on the right side in, with Timolol that you have a stronger IOP lowering effect if you have a higher baseline intraocular pressure, but a less IOP lowering effect if you have a not so high baseline intraocular pressure. This is different on the left side seen with Natasotil, where you have more or less the same IOP lowering efficacy, irrelevant what baseline level of intraocular pressure you have. This will be really interesting for the future as well, uh, and we will see what it brings us for the future. Uh, you can see over 12 months that there is no loss of efficacy in the studies given for patients uh, with Natasotil uh, once a day. If we look to the combination therapy, so this is a fixed combination of netazotil and latanoprost versus netazotil only given in the evening or latanoprost given in the evening. The fixed combination, by the way, was given in the evening as well. It was in open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertensives, and they were, I had RP measurement again at three times of the day, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and four in the afternoon. And you can see nicely that the fixed combination of netazotil and latanoprost was at every single IOP measurement superior to the mono components. And this was the same after 12 months, so you don't see a loss of efficacy with this uh, treatment. And if we look now what target pressure can we reach with the different medications, we can see that after three months, you have, for example, for less than 16 millimeters of mercury target pressure, you can see that nearly 60% of the patients will reach it with the fixed combination. This is much better than uh, any of the monotherapies by itself. And when we look now, for example, if we need more than 30% IOP reduction, you can see that you reach this with about 60% of the patient if you treat them with a fixed combination of netazotil and latanoprost compared to the monotherapies of either of these components. Now, how is it with the safety? The safety is interesting. There's only one a severe ocular side effect reported, but this is maybe not so relevant because it's in more than 1,600 patients, one agritocyclitis. What is actually more interesting is the uh, ocular side effects that you have with conjunctival hyperemia, verticella, and hemorrhage. You find this significantly more in metazotil compared to timolol treatment. So you find about 50% of the patients have conjunctival hyperemia, 20% have a verticillata, and a little bit less than 20% have hemorrhage. Pain is about the same in both groups. But how do we have to judge this now? If we look to the hyperemia, we must say that about nearly 80% of the patients had a very mild hyperemia, and uh, it remained the same over the time. So. That means that the hyperemia you have at the beginning, it will not worsen over the time. And most probably we can convince people if they have a mild hyperemia, but the drug by itself is significantly lowering the intraocular pressure that we uh, keep the medications like this. So it doesn't increase. For hemorrhage, it's interesting as well that most people, more than 90% had only a mild hemorrhage. And this is how it looked like. And actually, this was a self-resolving challenge. So it disappeared by the time. Uh, Verticillata is another interesting side effect and actually one that we have not seen up to now with any glaucoma medication. 
The patients are asymptomatic and the onset is between six to 13 months after starting the treatment. But there it was carefully looked on visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, visual function, and so on. And we must say that there is actually no clinical relevant change for these patients up to the final visit. So it's something what we can see in the patient, but the patients do not recognize it. It's just us, the doctors, who recognize it. Interestingly, it depends on the, if you give it twice a day or once a day, that you have it faster and it lasts longer if you give the, uh, the tazotil twice a day. But we anyway will give it only once a day, so we would have the less, the later onset than the earlier disappearance of the medication. If we look for safety uh, data for the netazotil latanoprost fixed combination, we can say that the most frequently one uh, was, again, the hyperemia, but the hyperemia again stayed the same over the time and did not change. They were looking on corneal uh, endothelial cell density. There was no change over the time. So it is irrelevant. And so as a conclusion, we can say that netazotil is an interesting new option that we have, and it lowers the pressure about the same in monotherapy as etimolol. It has an additional effect to prostaglandin. It has vertecidata as, an, uh, as a new side effect. The hyperemia is not a new side effect. You find it with other medications as well. It's very interesting that it's irrelevant from the baseline intraocular pressure. The efficacy of IOP lowering is the same over the time. And the second medication I want to show in brief is are the nitric oxides. It's a really interesting uh, drug target and uh, it uh, reduces the outflow distal of the trabecular meshwork by dilating the structures. And here again, it increases the outflow facility in the trabecular meshwork. And this was shown independent as an independent way in the humans and in the porcinites, but we don't have data for in vivo, we must say. Uh, the problem with release latanoprost bunot, it is uh, a medication which has a short half-life, the nitric oxides, but in combination with the prostaglandins, it will work longer. And you have, in the combination with the prostaglandin analog, you have two mechanisms of action. You have the uveous clearwell and the trabecular outflow working on it. And I just want to summarize the one Apollo study where they were looking on Visulta. This is the commercial name of the medication, which is available in the United States. It's not available in Europe, and I don't know how it's in the rest of the world. It was nicely shown that Visulta was not inferior to Timolol at all test points in this phase three of the Apollo and the Luna studies or a couple of studies. And it's, it's a really interesting option in my mind as well for the future. And for the side effects, it has quite a good tolerability, which is nearly as good as beta blocker when we know that this is a really good uh, tolerability actually for the medication. So as a summary, I want to say that despite the fact that we have great IOPLO acceptances, there is a horizon, there is something new in, on the way that are the rockinase inhibitors with a new mechanism and they are less dependent from baseline IOP, which is the most interesting advantage. I think the nitric oxides, they have an additional mechanism to the prostaglandins will be very helpful, I hope, for the future as well. And the slow release medications will be helpful if they come on the market, but they are still in the phase three level, but they will help us to reduce the compliance issue. Thank you very much for your attention.